But allow me uh, to, uh, to start with the question, and my question is uh, uh, to the Greek Prime Minister, because we have been, for the last five, six years, all the time talking about populism, the sources of populism, why people vote for these leaders. But it's much more interesting for understanding the strengths of democracy is to see the fate of the post-populist governments. In a certain way, from this point of view, Greek is a very interesting story. You remember 10 years ago, basically, people were talking about Greece as a country that cannot recover its democracy after the financial crisis, that people has lost their trust in democracy. So talking about democratic resilience, I do believe that the Greek prime minister is the person to tell us a story that probably everybody wants to hear. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ivan, for, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, indeed, uh, if I take you back uh, 11 years to 2010, uh, Greece faced uh, a massive uh, financial uh, crisis, which uh, led to multiple bailout programs the impoverishment of a significant segment of Greek society, uh, an austerity imposed from abroad, and significant resentment by the Greek population directed both against domestic elites, the domestic political class, but also against those that were considered rightly or wrongly responsible for the austerity measures that we had to, to endure. The, the result was that in 2015, we elected probably the first populist uh, government uh, in, in Europe. We were ahead of the, uh, of the trend at the time. It was a hard left uh, government that actually formed a coalition uh, with a party that was to the right of the party I represent. Interesting enough that uh, so sometimes when it comes to populism, um, uh, ideology is not such an important uh, uh, factor. And at the time, they were elected because uh, they clearly promised uh, a set of solutions that uh, uh, everybody knew uh, was impossible to implement, but people were willing to give them, uh, give them a chance because they completely mistrusted the old political establishment. And what happened uh, since was we had four years of, uh, I, I think I'm being kind, very mediocre uh, the government. And then in 2019, uh, Greeks decided to uh, elect the party I have the privilege of leading uh, into power with, uh, with an absolute uh, uh, majority. And I think the reason we reached that point was exactly because at the end of the day, our democracy and our institutions were resilient. Uh, we are a well-functioning uh, uh, democracy. I think there were attempts uh, at the time by the previous government to control independent media, to influence justice, but our institutions held up. Our constitutional court held up when uh, the previous government tried to pass a legislation that was deemed unconstitutional in terms of control of the media, they rejected it. So we had a, a, an institutional foundation that was strong enough uh, to prevent a populist government from capturing power and winning again. Because my theory is that uh, these governments become very dangerous, and they can become dangerous for democracy if they win a second election. Uh, uh, and we, we managed uh, to, uh, to avert that. But at the end of the day, uh, it all comes down to, to delivering results. Uh, I think since we, since we won, we listen to the grievances of people. The worst thing you can do as a politician fighting the populace is to believe that the reasons why the populists are elected in the first place are all wrong. That's not the case. There was uh, injustice, there was uh, inequality, there was corruption in Greece, uh, and one needs to understand that these grievances are reasonable, and we also need um, uh, to, to make our own self-criticism that uh, elites don't always you know, get it, uh, get it right, and we also need to, uh, to change course. And at the end of the day, it's all about delivering results. Uh, we're still quite popular as a government because we did essentially what we promised to do, uh, which is strange, uh, because the experience in Greece was always that you get elected and then you do the exact opposite. So when you do what you promise to do, people are, um, uh, I think, um, uh, pleasantly uh, surprised. So it is about, at the end of the day, uh, institutional resilience. It is about democratic maturity. But not many people would have placed a bet, uh, maybe even five years ago, that Greece would have turned the page. It has turned the page now. It has turned the page uh, for good. And I think we are a more resilient uh, democracy uh, now because exactly we went through this uh, very turbulent, a very difficult, very painful period. Uh, and we managed not only to, to survive, but I think we're stronger now. We're stronger economically, but we're also stronger institutionally and democratically. Thank you very much. And by the way, political scientist Stephen has noticed this. The rise of populism has increased the trust in democracy 
in many of societies who, which went through a populist cycle. Because in a certain way, people felt empowered, something that was quite important coming from the Munich report. If you have the feeling that you can change nothing, you lost trust in the system. If you change in the wrong way, at least you have the capacity of self-correction. Self and from this point of view, it's important. But then I want you to go uh, to, uh, to the Speaker of the American Congress, because there is one thing that really the question I always wanted to ask you, because you're experiencing this on an everyday basis. If you read the opinion polls, everybody in the United States is ready to defend democracy. The only problem is that many people believe that the biggest threat of democracy is the other party winning elections. So how political polarization is changing our understanding of democracy and what is your response to a situation in which basically attack on democracy is not coming from forces which declare themselves being anti-democratic, but attack on democracy is people who basically say that what they're doing is simply defending democracy. So please. Thank you, Ivan. It's nice to be back with you again. Madam Minister, thank you for your strong and inspiring words. It's an honor to be with you. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for giving me the privilege to be on this panel, this particular panel, because we're talking about democracy when Greece will be celebrating the 100th anniversary of democracy in Greece. 200. 200. Last year, yeah. 200. So, um, again, appropriate subject, uh, honored. But also, let us salute once again every chance we get the ambassador for his great leadership uh, of, of the, 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 the Munich, Munich Security Conference. For all of those years, we're deeply in your debt, anyone who cares about freedom and security. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The, um, let me just back up from your premise. First of all, the, uh, the idea of democracy is about freedom of speech, freedom of expression. It's about having respect for other people's views. And the um, first thing I want to do is to say how happy we're all to be here to join with other countries. And the unity of the NATO alliance, the transatlantic alliance, is so important to us. And I want to acknowledge our members of our delegation who are here. If you can stand up, and that's an applause line. <laughs> we have probably with the, uh, there's another delegation here too, uh, mostly the Senate, but some House members. We're about 40 members of Congress present at this, uh, uh, at this conference, and I hope that's an indication to you of the importance we place on it, the uh, value that it has for all of us who care about security, which is essential to freedom, as you discussed. The, uh, in terms of uh, elections and what is, supports a democracy, I don't think any of us over time ever ha who ran for Congress ever came with the idea that we were running for Congress and we needed to win because it would save democracy. We had our points of view about the role of government, and my purpose was children. You've heard me say, you got to Take a punch for the children, throw a punch for the children. But, but that's, you know, you have enough confidence in what you believe, enough humility to listen and respect other people's views. That was how we think about democracy. And as far as the Republicans are concerned, I tell the Republicans I know, and I do know some, take back your party. This isn't who you are. Because, Yvonne, the fact is, in this election, democracy is on the ballot. I would never have said that before, but after January 6th and the uh, um, events and legislation that have passed around the country to suppress the vote, to nullify elections, well, that is democracy. It, when you just decide to nullify an election, then you are undermining the basic principle, the sanctity of the vote that is democracy. So this time, I would say, and I don't want to tattoo my views onto my colleagues, but speaking as Speaker of the House and protecting the prerogatives of the House of Representatives as a, as a temple of democracy, I would say this time doesn't have to be that way. The Republicans still have a chance to nominate people who are not there to undermine the sanctity of the vote, to nullify the election. 
What you saw on January 6 was an assault on the Capitol, the temple of democracy in our view. Terrible, but worse, a, an attack on the Congress, worse, an attack on the Constitution of the United States. A day, that Wednesday was the day designated by the Constitution to implement the peaceful transfer of power from one administration to the next. The people who went there, who were incited to go there, came to get the boxes with the certifications so that that could not happen. That undermines democracy. So if that's what's on the ballot, then democracy is on the ballot to defeat that. But it shouldn't be, we've never had that thought, if we don't win, democracy is hurt. No, except now because of what was said there. But uh, instead of that, I mean, the point is, is that we're there to make sure that democracy has more transparency, uh, that people have trust, that one of the reasons they were going after us is because we wanted to end big, dark, special interest money in politics. We wanted to stop the suppression of the vote and the uh, uh, nullification of elections, and that's, part of the assault they have on us. But transparency, accountability, we've heard those words before uh, in this conference, very important to democracy. I would just say uh, that just erasing all party differences, just to say we must all believe that the most important thing we can do to strengthen our democracy is to have trust, that the people trust the system, that they um, they trust the system in that they know that their interests are being served, uh, that they, that, again, that there is accountability. Another thing I would say in the world, you know, beyond our own countries, is uh, that we must end corruption if we're going to restore trust and confidence in our system, whether it's our economic system or our electoral system. And if we do that, if we stop that big dark money, and the, uh, uh, if, if we and increase civility in our process, guess what will happen? Many more women will be in positions of power. And this is very wholesome. Nothing is more wholesome than that for democracy and governance. And that also means people of color, whether they're women or not, young people and the rest. So while there, rather than debating whether we think, with all due respect to your question, Yvonne, uh, what we'd like to be thinking about is how do we strengthen democracy? How can we do it in a nonpartisan way? How can we do it to be an example to the world? And how can we do it working together? The beauty of the EU and the NATO alliance is that we are, well, at least upon entry, the EU, we were, uh, democracies and some weakening of the system there in some places. But in any event, the, again, the trust, reduce the role of money. I hear that from every place I go. I speak at colleges all over the world. What, is a, what are you doing to reduce the role of big, dark money in politics? That's what our legislation does in the Congress that we would hope could pass the Senate. So no, no, I don't think that, except for this time, when they have placed the democracy on the ballot, that, that we ever believed that we had to win in order for democracy to be protected. Thank you very much. And you put the problem of trust, and I want to go uh, uh, to the minister, because one of the interesting things that I noticed during the COVID crisis is that, by the way, the populist parties did not benefit from the COVID crisis, but mistrust has been deepened. And for you, particularly in a position of a minister of defense, trust is critical. People should trust what they're telling them happening in places which they don't know. How many of your voters have ever visited Donbass? So from this point of view, I'm very much interested seeing from the perspective of somebody who should not simply take decisions which are going to be very tough in a situation of a high tensions on international level, but how ready are our people to trust after these two very difficult years of COVID and coming and restrictions and what works, what does not work. 
because uh, just give you one figure just recently, European Council on Foreign Relations did a survey in some of the EU member states. Majority of people of all these countries believe that they're going to be a war between Russia and Ukraine till the end of the year. Just several years ago, this was impossible type of a polling. Europeans didn't believe that war can happen in Europe. So this is my question to you on the trust issue, and particularly being a minister of defense of a democratic country with a very strong pacifist public opinion, how it's easy to function and to convince people to do things that till yesterday for them was just not part of this world. <laughs> Um, vielen Dank für die Frage und ich Thank beantworte you very much sie for aber auch this question gerne noch. and I love to answer it against the background of uh, uh, my experience that I had during my last term. I used to be minister responsible for justice back then and during the pandemic times it was very important and has been very important to work against fake news and make it clear what the facts are like so that our citizens were able to obtain information on all the developments. And after all, it was all new. I mean, every, every single one of us basically uh, did not know that much about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We were unprepared, surprised, and we also had to rely on the fact that the information that we obtained was also a proper foundation for political uh, decisions. And that is why it's so important to make sure that any attacks from populists, uh, those self-proclaimed lateral thinkers, conspiracy theories, that these attacks are made transparent and visible to the public at large. So it's very important for us in our democracies to speak up and stand up for democracy and also to make sure any attacks on the democratic uh, system are uh, made transparent. And this is very much on my mind as the Ministry for Defense because, of course, we're talking about conventional attacks also, quite clearly so, but all these attacks, misinformation, lack of information, and also the attempt that these day Stabilizing countries and trying to widen the gap between EU states, NATO member states. That's a major risk, and this is something that we're facing right now. And that is why it's very important to vet and uh, review all your sources to exchange information and to not just come up with some woolly information. Make it very clear that citizens will understand our decisions. And we managed to do that, even if we have or had a very l l small minority that was very loud during the pandemic, shouting that we are the people. No, they were not the people. That was just a small, loud minority, a very small very loud minority, but nevertheless, they tried to create the impression as if they were a majority. So every piece of information really has to be reviewed most intensively before you use it as a basis for your information. That's so important, and especially when we're talking about decisions that, for example, will uh, might result in military operations. So anyone who jumps the gun there, anyone who does not uh, decide on the basis of facts will make huge political response, and you would have to be accountable for that. Thank you very much. Talking about conspiracy theories, I very much feel at home, because I'm Bulgarian and probably we have more conspiracy theories per person uh, than any other place in the world. Uh, but importantly, here comes also the problem of technology, because conspiracy theories have been around for a long time, but now they run faster. And people basically can be infected much quicker. So I know that in the room we have the president and vice chair of Microsoft. And because I want to open to the audit, I'm very much interested, Mr. Smith, where this relations, democracy, technology, democratic resilience, how you see it. Well, no, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And I think the defense minister defined this well. We all have to keep in mind the fragility of freedom if we're going to defend democracy well. And I think we have to recognize that we do live in a time, unfortunately, where democracy is under threat. And technology is playing a role in magnifying that threat. 
One of the challenges for conspiracy theories is that they're fueled not only domestically, but frankly, from abroad and from nation states as well. And when we look back at 2021, it was a year that unfortunately showed that it was easier to invent a vaccine than to persuade people to use it. And when we study what happened, one of the things that we see in bold relief is that part of the problem was, in fact, a nation-state-sponsored disinformation campaign to persuade people, in part, that American vaccines, among others, were not safe or effective. And when we look back at the American election of 2016 or the year since, if we look at what is happening in American politics today, or we look at the spread of disinformation about Ukraine in the last month, we increasingly can see the presence of nation-state sponsorship that is fueling domestic disinformation as well. In fact, at Microsoft, as we've analyzed the recent trends, we've seen in the United States alone, in the last month, over 400 million page views from documented disinformation sites, often hosted outside the United States. If they were combined into a news organization, they would be the fourth largest news organization in the United States. And so part of what we're going to have to do to defend our democracies is work together to defend against this. Technology is fueling it, and we'll need technology to help stop it, specifically in four ways. We have to do better in detecting it. If you look at how the private and public sectors have advanced over the last five years to detect nation-state cyber attacks, even of the sort we've seen in the last few weeks, we're able to detect them in a matter of minutes or hours. But when we see nation-state-sponsored disinformation, we're still working at a much slower pace. And it will take governments and, among others, tech companies to come together. Second, I think we're going to have to bring to disinformation some of what we've deployed in other forms of cyber threats to disrupt these kinds of cyber attacks. The reality is that disinformation relies on a technology ecosystem to host websites, to direct traffic, in fact, to pay for the websites themselves with the use of, of advertising. But as we understand the problem better, we can work together to address it. Third, I think we need to step back and look at what it's going to take to defend against these threats. And if there's one thing that the domestic and foreign disinformation campaigns have in common, they're taking advantage of the weakness, the fragility of democracy at a time when traditional journalism has been in decline. In fact, when we analyze disinformation trends in the United States, we are seeing that the content is being consumed at a disproportionate pace in the parts of the country that have seen newspapers disappear. That's not a surprise. And we need to figure out how to revitalize traditional journalism, which rightly should always be considered, I think, the fourth pillar of democracy. And finally, we're going to need new steps to deter these kinds of efforts, to come together to define new international norms and work to defend them. So I think all of the problems that you all have described come together at, unfortunately, this nexus of technology first making it worse. Now we have to figure out how to harness technology to fight back against it. Thank you very much. And if somebody wants to react, please, Mr. Minstek. I think Brad made extremely uh, valid um, uh, points uh, about the very quick spread of uh, disinformation and how difficult it is to uh, identify the source of them. I just want to add another dimension to the connection between technology and democracy, because I'm afraid that when we talk about this topic, we almost immediately think of disinformation about social media platforms. There's another dimension and another more positive story and taking a cue from what the speaker said about you know, fighting corruption and increasing transparency, technology can be invaluable in terms of simplifying the interaction between the state, citizens, and businesses. Uh, in Greece, the most successful reform 
uh, it has sort of 80% uh, uh, approval across parties has been the digitization of the state and the ability uh, to, to interact seamlessly without human interaction, which frequently can be a source uh, of, of, of petty corruption. And this is, uh, has really, it has increased the trust in the state because we deliver um, we respect people's time. We don't have them, you know, come in for unnecessary bureaucratic um, uh, procedures. Uh, and it is a completely different way of uh, rewiring the way the public administration uh, works. So let us not forget in this debate uh, about technology and democracy, there's also another side, uh, a very positive uh, uh, story. I can tell you these solutions can be implemented very quickly, relatively cheaply, and the benefit uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, time saved for citizens, but also the benefits in terms of transparency are just huge. Yeah, thank you. May. Uh, you used the word fragility twice. You used it in your opening sentence, and you referenced um, Madam, the defense minister's comments. And I just happen to have a quote from a Republican that says, and his name is Ronald Reagan, and he said, freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from ex extinction. It is, ours by way of it is not ours by way of inheritance. Uh, it must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. So you and Ronald Reagan and I are in agreement on the fragility of it. Uh, so I was surprised to hear, see you here and to see your, hear your question, not your question as a surprise, but... Uh, to put it in the perspective of, I've read your book, Brad Smith wrote a book, Tools and Weapons, just the contrast of what uh, social media is. And the fact is, is, there are many good things, as the Prime Minister has said, that spring from all of that. But there's some very, very dangerous things that have sprung from companies deciding, social media platforms deciding, that their business model was more important than our democracy. The foreign money coming in, paid for by rubles, you would think they would know it's from Russia, to Facebook at, in the election of 2016, was a stunning intervention into our election. But all along, we've seen, whether it's about the, 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 um, the pandemic and the rest, other misinformation out there. So as the defense minister said, you have to check it out. You have to make sure people know what is real, what the facts are. It doesn't mean you can't have a disagreement about one thing or another. That's the democratic way. But it does mean that if for profit, these platforms are, are using what it could be a blessing, and in many ways <laughs> can be. But is the, is the um, uh, danger that it poses where people who are subjected to the danger. Two million people became members of uh, QAnon on Facebook because they gravitate toward people who think the way they do. That's the way it is on, on the internet. That doesn't sound like a bad thing, except if it's QAnon, and that is a bad thing. And, and yet, um, they knew the danger of their algorithms, and they wouldn't stop it. So again, Congress will act. But it really is up to, and if you say this in your book, you have to have some regulation, but you have to have something coming from the industry itself, which knows probably better than any of us how to clean up its act uh, when it comes to all of that. So it was foreign intervention into our elections. It was a defiance of science in our fighting a pandemic. Uh, whether it was mask using or uh, vaccinations or whatever it happened to be. But this is a big challenge for us as we go forward. Again, I come back to my favorite subject, for the children. Children are greatly exposed in the social media uh, and it's, it's a dangerous situation. We should all be taking more responsibility. Now, one thing we'll, we probably will look at, and 
revise is Section 230 of the uh, Telecommunication Code, more than you want to know on the subject about our code in, in the United States. But the glory of it all, the glory that it could be of people communicating in so many ways, uh, telemedicine, distance learning, families communicating with each other, learning, learning of so many things about the world, even as in a formal education, it, it has a, it's a beautiful prospect. But I, advi I, I advise all of you to read Brad Smith's book, Tools and Weapons. <laughs> this you was didn't commercial. Know, I didn't know it was going to be here, so this is not a setup. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, uh, before going to the minister, I really want to stress something that comes both from uh, the speaker and from uh, prime minister. Because what always strikes me is when we talk about disinformation, nobody believes that he himself is a victim of disinformation. Everybody believes that disinformation, this is the reason why others do not agree with you. Even in a world in which there is no disinformation, in democracy, people differ what you say. They have different values, they have different perspectives, but it's critically important to know that people are making their differences on the base of the objective information of what is happening in the world. And from this point of view, how to fight disinformation without demonizing any difference as a result of disinformation, in my view, is also one of the important challenges. And I'm very much interested how your minister sees these relations between technology and democracy. Ich war bekannt als Justizministerin, dass ich ganz konsequent gegen Hass und Hetze und gegen Fake News war. Harassment und Fake News auf dem Internet war es mir wichtig, dass die Freiheit der Meinung geschützt wird und dass als Folge davon es klare Grenzen gibt. Nicht nur wenn es um verschiedene Meinungen geht, solange sie auf Fakten sind. Das ist kein Problem. Aber sobald die Grenzen überschritten werden, with regard to crimes or also definitive fake news, the state has to react. And in that context, I was often asked whether the internet was more a curse or a blessing to me. And I'd like to repeat it, it's a blessing because it contributed to a democratization of knowledge. Today, everybody in this world has access to all sources of knowledge, which is a blessing. It is a democratic movement. We've seen this in different centuries, whenever people have access to knowledge, this translates into something that's positive and further development. This is a blessing for democracies. Now it is up to us to ensure that this stays like that, that it's not technology that becomes a problem, but the people who use technology wrong, who use it to either start attacks, to destabilize, to um, rattle societies, that's our task, not to fight technology, but the way people wrongly use it. This morning, um, I checked out Twitter because there was a shitstorm um, because a state minister in Germany said something wrong, and somebody said, how nice was it when um, Twitter was only used by nerds, by a couple of interested nerds? That's not true. The whole world uses it today, and it's good that this is the way it is. And it's our task now to set rules, to set regulations. And in these times, it is important to have credible, neutral organizations that count fake news, that identify them, that don't tell the individual you're stupid because you um, became a victim of it. No, that just disclose the facts. Don't judge it. Just assess it and say, this is definitely wrong, can be proven by this and that source. Fact checking. And with that, you reach out to people who still are open minded. There are always going to be people who are captured in their theories that you will never be able to get them out anymore. But you can reach out to the majority. And that's our responsibility to ensure that these independent, accepted institutions exist to counter this. And if we're honest, 
it took too long for us to recognize this, to recognize what this technology could be used for, because everybody was so happy that everybody could reach everybody else and get information and communicate. And it took a certain amount of time to understand this. So this is now a reaction to something that, with a little bit of a lag time, happen, but it has to happen, and it has to happen at all levels and using all of the possibilities that we have. I can't pass a law against fake news, because what is fake news? We tried to do this at the European level, and we discussed it so often. We have the Digital Services Act, and um, we want to establish some rules here, but I always say, how can I prohibit fake news? I first have to define it. Explaining it, educating people is the right tool, but this needs to be done in a very consistent way. You should never say, this is just a few crazies who um, say that. The danger that exists, because many people are prone to that kind of news, needs to be understood, and we need to invest in countering that. Thank you very much. We have an opportunity for two or three quick questions, and I'm very much trying to see if somebody is interested to enter this conversation. Please. New woman. Eva. By the way, in uh, late socialism, our idea of democracy was it's society in which people speak publicly what they speak in their kitchens. But then we realized that what people speak in their kitchens is not exactly also the way you're running society. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Ivan, and um, thank you to the panelists um, this evening. Speaker Pelosi, you spoke about trust. You started talking about trust. And then I'm very glad that the topic of technology kind of very naturally came into that discussion. You mentioned the events of January 6th, elections of 2020, and what struck me at some point, and you said, Congress will act. But can you be a little bit more specific when it comes to digital legislation? Where do you think Congress should act, perhaps? Because very often, Europeans are the ones that are being accused that we as policymakers, I'm a member of the European Parliament, are the ones that overregulate, seen from an American perspective or an American company perspective, so to say. But technology is crucial to our democratic values, after all, and I think this, this panel very well demonstrated that. So when we speak about the future of democracy, it's linked to the development of technologies. So your views on where would Congress possibly legislate will be uh, very important for us to hear. Thank you. <laughs> well, this is something, uh, again, the European Union is ahead of us in privacy legislation, and we have, that's part of one of the, one of the uh, aspects we have to address. But before I go there, and I'm so glad that you have a woman answering, asking a question. I was rooting for that all, earlier. The, um, with all due respect to you, Brad, <laughs> Uh, just a couple things, and, and I think I, I hesitate to say this, but I think I must. When you say, and I completely agree with you, uh, Madam Minister, that, that we shouldn't be thinking people less of people because they believe something that we know not to be true, and it's really not a matter of opinion, it's a, a fact that they... Uh, you have to remember that many of the people in our country were victimized by the President of the United States. When the President of the United States says something, his words, weigh, or hers to be, his words weigh a ton. So when people uh, fall for it, it's really not as much their responsibility. It's not, well, you said this and the President said that. Most people tend to believe what the President of the United States says, at least if it's a president of their own party. So this was not just um, um, any disrespect for anybody not thinking the way we do or falling for something they shouldn't. This was about a president of the United States who, with his words, incited an insurrection to interfere with the peaceful transfer of power. Up until that time, he was telling people they didn't have to get vaccinated, they shouldn't be wearing that, mocking science. So anti-science and anti-governance 
We don't believe in science if, that you should be vaccinated or have a mask. And we don't believe that government should tell us or suggest to us that that would be a good place because the president is telling us something different. So not, not that they should, everybody should be absolved from believing him, but he is the president of the United States. So may you never confront that as you weigh the equities of, um, uh, you know, let's just try to convince them otherwise. If it's the president or the prime minister of your country, it's harder to do because people have a tendency to believe what they want to believe uh, anyway. The um, question about uh, what we do in Congress, we, that's under discussion. We have legislation that has passed out of the Judiciary Committee in the House of Representatives. Some have come out of the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. We'll uh, come together and and do that, but something that uh, Minister said is very important. We respect the right to, people's right to speak. You know, how do you make adjustments respectful of the First Amendment, but nonetheless careful about uh, the exploitation of all of that uh, on the internet? So we, we're on a path. We have legislation. Mr. Cicilline has some. Some people object to that. The industry. Uh, as you can just imagine, is not eager for us to do anything, uh, but hopefully we'll come to a place that does gets the job done. But it is definitely now. I myself have been an advocate to change a Section 230 for a long time. Uh, I think that probably has a chance because others think that way in a bipartisan way. But this legislation will have to be bipartisan, bicameral, and uh, it, it should be. It should be happening. It should be happening soon. But the, one other point I want to make, because you, you really have to read Brad's book, because you talked about going back a long time when people communicated. Well, he starts with when people learned how to talk, and then they learned how to write, and then they wrote books, but not really printed. And then came Gutenberg and libraries and all of that. So the whole um, respect for communication is something uh, th that is a, a treasure to us, but as you said, the internet just exploded in such a very positive way, and uh, it has its ups and downs, but it certainly is something that we did not want to, we don't want that uh, uh, to ever go away. Thank you very much. We're at the end of our time. I don't believe this is the end of the conversation about the resilience of democracy. But let's see, in three sentences, summarize what I heard from your side, and I found this very interesting. You say the most important for the German army is to understand that they're not simply defending German state, but German democracy, and uh, starting with the president. And in my view, this is critically important. And then, basically, speaker, you said there are moments in which democracy is on ballot and not one or the other party. It's a rare moment in history, but they exist. And then, of course, I do believe that uh, the most optimistic message come from the Greek prime minister who said, there is life after populism, so we should enjoy it. Thank you. Even, uh, may I just follow up on what you said? Because uh, it is on the ballot, but that is not the purpose of the election. The election is about results for the American people, for us. We don't, we don't campaign and say democracy's on the ballot. We're talking about their kitchen table concerns. Are they gonna be able to feed their families, educate their children, pay the rent, pay the utility bill, and the rest of that? It's about, you know, I talked about trust and accountability and, and transparency, but it's about results. So elections are about results and what it means in people's lives. Motivation, is about all of that first and foremost, but we also have a responsibility uh, to make sure that we protect our democracy. But I don't want you to think that that's a campaign. No, the campaign is what, we, what it means at the kitchen table uh, of American working families. And our caucus is very diverse. We take great pride in our House caucus, over 70% women, people of color, LGBTQ, it's, it's a beautiful sight to behold, and a variety of opinions, generational, geographic, ethnic, everything you can name, right, Barbara Lee, who's worked on all these issues? But 
But what unifies us as a party is our values, our values, and our value is about America's working families. So that is the message we talk about, is for the people, lower costs, bigger paychecks, cleaner government. Thank you very much. And listen, I'm sure that nobody of you doubt that on the panel you have three persons who know what elections are about because they know how to win them. So thank you very much. <laughs>